I would like to welcome you to tonight's viewing of the documentary Valuing Lives, Wolf Wolfensberger and the Principle of Normalization. My name is Cameron Betcher, and I work in the archives of the McGugan Library of Medicine. I have been most closely associated with Wolf Wolfensberger's collection, so to see his work celebrated as a historical documentary is something really quite special. Although I have never had the pleasure to meet Wolf personally, I feel as if I know him quite well through curating his collection and conversations with many of his colleagues. It is an unfortunate aspect of my job as I get to know these great individuals only from what they leave behind. I can assure you, Wolf was just that, a great individual. We are very proud to have his collection, and as he began his career here, it seems only fitting that his legacy rests here, and as more resources become available, we will be able to do more with his collection. I would like to give a special thank you to Wolf's daughter, Joan, for flying out to be here with us, as well as our panelists, Joe Massarelli, Susan Thomas, and Jane Barkin, whom I will introduce more formally after the documentary. I do want to thank my colleagues that are attending and helping out, and a special thank you to John Schleicher, Mary Helms, and Stuart Dayton for their involvement in planning tonight's event, as well as Meg Johnson and Annie Boger from the NU Foundation, and also our director of the McGugan Library, Emily McElroy. I would like to thank Tom O'Connor and John Keenan from Public Relations, as well as KETV, for their help in publicizing tonight's event. Uh, before we begin, just a reminder to power off all noisemakers. <laughs> um, and if you need to leave the room for any reason, please do so quietly. Uh, and once again, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. We will begin the documentary momentarily, followed by our question and answer session. And I'm certain you will find it very powerful. It is at this time I want to introduce our panelists for tonight. Joe Massarelli is the director of the Social Role Valorization Implementation Project, a human service training and consultation concern based in Worcester, Massachusetts. She divides her time between teaching social role valorization workshops and related topics and working to affect positive change for individuals with impairments through direct service and consultation. She has taught workshops and lectured at conferences across the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan to a variety of human service workers serving a range of people devalued due to mental and or physical impairment, mental disorder, old age, and poverty. Susan Thomas has been, associate, has been an associate of the Training Institute at Syracuse for many years and holds degrees in psychology and special education. She is the author of numerous articles on normalization and social role valorization and is co-author with Professor Wolfensberger of Passing and Other Publications. Ms. Thomas has also worked for many years in voluntary informal service to people with disabilities and poor and homeless people. She has presented at workshops with Professor Wolfensberger in many countries. She is a regular columnist for the SRV Journal, and Susan directs the Training Institute for Human Service Planning, Leadership, and Change Agentry, and also serves as the training coordinator. Jane Barkin has been involved in human services and associated with the late Dr. Wolfensberger for many years. Much of her career has focused on the preparation of new workers for people with intellectual impairments. Her main emphasis is on teaching and training in social role valorization. She developed some of the earliest online SRV training used at community colleges in Canada. She is a board member for several organizations that use SRV in the implementation of their services. And, a, and she is a member of the Southern Ontario Training Group, which provides SRV passing and other related trainings in Ontario. And we have added another panelist, the other Dr. Wolfensberger. <laughs> Wolf's daughter is here to answer questions too. And uh, with that, I turn them over to you. And uh, hopefully we can get some good, good questions. Um, and I would like to point out that everybody has a mic. So if you have a question, press and hold and then just ask away. All right, well, I'll start, I guess. <laughs> I do have a question for Joe, because I know this is interest to you. Um, could you elaborate on how in a hospital setting, the role of patient in many cases is a devalued role? And those should be on. Okay. Well, if you've been in the hospital recently, anyone here, you could probably explain that. But, um, Oftentimes, what happens is, as we teach in social role valorization, what people see is the illness 
or the devalued condition, and not the person, and not what's, what's, uh, what's behind that. And so what happens is people's illnesses may or may not be treated adequately, but as a person, they get lost in the shuffle. So people get known as the gallbladder in room six, as opposed to Miss Massarelli, who has a hurt belly and who needs, besides medical attention, some other important things that uphold her status and her well-being. So that's one of the reasons. But another thing that happens is, particularly when people enter into the hospital with impairments, then oftentimes what we see is their condition is viewed as fundamentally different, their medical condition is viewed as fundamentally different because they have an impairment, an intellectual or a, a, some kind of a mental impairment. So in other words, breast cancer in someone with an intellectual impairment appears more dire, less curable, than breast cancer in someone who doesn't have a mental impairment. And so we have much um, evidence that people with intellectual impairments and people with, who enter the hospital with devalued conditions don't get offered the same excellent standards of care that someone who doesn't have an impairment would expect to have. So that's just a brief um, look at it, but there's much more to say. Dr. Wolfensberger wrote an excellent guide for attending people in the hospital. And he incorporates a lot of, there it is, and he incorporates, and you can purchase it yourself for only, no, that, that, is, that is available um, for sale. And many people have found it to be a very useful guide when um, supporting someone in the hospital, whether they have an impairment or not. And we also teach a workshop on that topic, on supporting people in the hospital, too. That was a very uh, essential part of Wolf's insight. Thank you. Anybody have any questions themselves? Of course, Cam, as, you, as your dad, I'll ask something here. Um, when it comes to the social role valorization uh, community itself, um, I know it's more, it's an international type group. How does someone get involved uh, more on a local level with the SRV group where if you don't have the wherewithal to go to your conference every two years or whatever it is that's done you know, in different areas, how can you get involved with, with SRV? Well, um, it's very funny to hear us referred to as an SRV community. That's because we're pretty small in number. Um, as you heard in the film, uh, the ideas uh, that Dr. Wolfensberger taught and that got taken up, they always showed some effect and uh, had some movement, but they never really... Um, one, you might say. <laughs> they were always, uh, you know, uh, the, in the minority, a struggling minority. And so there are people all around the world. You saw some people from Australia and, and England and so on, as well as Canada and the United States, um, who have taken these ideas on board and tried to implement them, but we're a pretty loose group, you know. Um, but uh, anybody can take the ideas, of course, and that's one of the reasons why Wolf published. You saw this book in the um, in the video, and uh, uh, Cameron has them up in the archives, you know, um, and there's a, a journal that is put out by uh, Joe Massarelli and her husband's organization um, that teaches SRV. So um, we've always tried to get people to take up the ideas, and then because the ideas are, as we said, a minority idea, they're not the most popular one and so on, people always want to have companionship and fellowship so that they don't feel that they're alone. And typically what happens is people in a certain locale who, who read the book or form a study circle or um, uh, maybe people in a parent's organization would take on some of the ideas or a couple of people come to an event, they will say, who else thinks this is a good idea, you know, and they'll get together locally and, and so on. Um, but um, I don't really, yeah, 
we just try to spread the ideas every way we can, including through the printed word and the teaching and the, the journal and so on. There's a, there's a blog, of course. There's a website. There's um, uh, what else is there? A couple of Facebook pages. And... Well, if you're interested, have we got a workshop for you? <laughs> That's generally what happens, is people come to a workshop um, it's true they also read about these ideas, but oftentimes they just come to a teaching about it, and um, it makes them curious, and as Susan said, it makes them want more, and they keep showing up, and then we work with them, and then we help them teach themselves, you know, teach, help us teach the workshop, because if you can teach it, then it becomes your own. And so we're constantly on the look for, for people who are like-minded. And that's why we do have conferences every four years. Not every two, but every four. And um, the next one's kind of in this neck of the woods. It's in Winnipeg. But I'm from Boston, so it's, it's closer. <laughs> um, and that's going to be in June 2018. And sometimes people show up at those conferences because they've heard a little bit and they want more. So it's a, it's a grassroots development of people and um, seems, to, seems to do okay. Jane, do you have more to say? Yes, I do. So um, in Ontario, where I'm from, there are about 14 community colleges that offer training programs for young human service workers who will work in uh, residential services, for instance, or in educational services, or a number of other areas. And um, I'm talking a little bit in the past tense for myself since I've retired recently, but I taught in one of those programs. And some students would become absolutely captivated by the material and want to know more and more. Some of the human service programs used uh, social role valorization as a, a foundation for much of what they taught in many different areas. And so there would, there would be students who would become very interested, and then we would encourage them to come to a social role valorization workshop, a four-day workshop, and they might go on and um, attend a passing workshop as well, which is when the um, when one actually looks at evaluation, as you saw in the film a little bit. And, and then some of those people take it even further. <laughs> An interesting comment I heard at, at one of the workshops was a young person came to it, and he said, that Dr. Wolfensberger, he's a rock star for me. <laughs> and so, so it's just, it, it's, it captivates some people, it captures them. Now, clearly it doesn't do that for everyone, but it does for a certain population of people. And they find their way to social role valorization in all sorts of different routes and avenues. Uh, I work at Disability Rights Nebraska, and, and there is a, a, a group that sponsors values-based training and has done so since 2006. In fact, we've uh, sponsored... I think 11 social role valorization workshops. There was just a passing uh, workshop that was held uh, in late October, early November. Um, Power of roles, meaningful day. I mean, uh, so there is a group of people if you're if you're interested, um, um, and we do it by hook and by crook, um, and we've just kind of continued to to stay together. Uh, so. Um, if you're interested, I would encourage you to give us a call at Disability Rights Nebraska. We could we could um, connect you with with the coalition. Thank you. And that's in Lincoln. It is. The the documentary is extremely powerful. What uh, what plans are being made for distribution, and is it possible to get a copy of it? What are what what's the distribution? process and plans? Uh, well, the director, Jerry Smith, has a lovely website that um, you could find extended interviews from everybody he interviewed. 
But um, I think the easiest way is if you're interested in purchasing this, the easiest way to do so is just type in, just Google valuing lives Wolf Wolfensberger. And the first site that will come up um, is a, a site based from the University of Minnesota, and that's how they distribute. It's, it's sold for $25 a copy. And, sorry, were you going to speak, Joan? Um, so the, the producer, Jerry Smith, interviewed over 70 people, and so you can see that a, an hour-long film is <laughs> it's a very small percentage. So he's trying to make all of the other ones available um, eventually, at least over time, online, but many of them are available now online, so there are all sorts of different ideas that can be taken and followed further and you know, hear what, more what people have to say. But, but anyway, the, the DVD, um, as Cameron said, just, yeah. You know, I want during the uh, during the film, it, it was, uh, and I mean this in a positive sense, that uh, Dr. Wolfsonsberger was a kind of a techno geek. And uh, I'm just wondering, with uh, the revolution that's really going on with technology and what have you, h how might that impact what the approach, the approaches that Dr. Wol Wolfsonsberg initiated and and espoused, how, how those might be impacted with uh, new technologies and what have you in being able to uh, improve the lives of uh, the, the people that uh, are benefiting from his work. Good question. And I think he would appreciate that question. Dr. Wolfensberger was, um, very thoughtful about the use of any technology. And he would submit it the way he did many new ideas to a pretty rigorous interrogation of will this be, will this be useful? How will this be useful? And also how will this be perverted? As you heard um, uh, Mr. Bergman say in the film. So he was not somebody who would just run in and embrace the newest thing. You know, he would really think hard about it, and he, would, he wouldn't um, go for it unless it was past the tests. Now, having said that, when we teach social role valorization, we think about two big overriding issues, one having to do with competency and one having to do with image. And so technology would be interrogated with those ideas, too. How will this improve the person's image, and how will this improve their competency? And um, so there's a lot of thought that would go into it before any particular approach, whether it's a technology or anything else, would be embraced. Um, he didn't use email. Susan, do you want to add to that? I wanted to ask um, Joan, and actually first I wanted to mention something that I mentioned to our panelists today, that if, you're, if you haven't been in this building before or on this campus, we are literally walking in the footsteps of Dr. Wolfensberger because the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute was on this spot. Um, it was eventually, when it was closed, it became our university geriatric center, and then it, the building was torn down to make way for these research towers. So we are sitting and walking in his footsteps today. but. Um, I wanted Joan to talk a little bit about her dad as a dad and what that was like. We heard a little bit from Margaret in the video, but, and also um, maybe your, a little bit about your neighbor and your dad's colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Menelacino, who some of you may be familiar with. They were neighbors and friendly collaborators and debaters, and their families lived across the fence from each other, so. Okay, thank you for the good question. Hi, I'm Joan Wolfensberger. I am the middle daughter. Uh, my sister Margaret is um, 16 months older than I am, and um, I am the middle. And then my brother Paul is uh, five years younger than I am. At, I'm sorry, five years. Yeah, five years younger than I am, and six years younger than my than my sister. Oh boy, that's a huge question. Thank you so much. 
I was thinking my dad's idea of technology. No, I mean, <laughs> um, as a as a father, I mean, we we had a cottage industry going on. We did everything. We we were so proficient. And now I think about it, and you know, I, when I have to hire, you know, and have hired younger people, they don't know how to do anything. I mean, seriously, they just don't know how to. You know, they wouldn't be able to take that exacto knife and make a. And I thought I looked at an overhead today, and I thought, why did they? What was the purpose of, you know, making a forty-five degree angle across all of the tape that you mounted a transparency with? You know, the precursor to, to. Uh, did he ever use power? He never used PowerPoint. Oh my goodness, unbelievable! Um, and all three of us children, we consider ourselves pretty tech savvy. Um, he was a dis disciplinarian. He was very strict. And we did not have um, the normal, quote unquote, sort of high school experience. You know, he didn't, you weren't going to go to football games and things like that. If you, if we went to those sorts of things, we snuck out. You know, we said we were babysitting or something, which was also very difficult to get away with. So you didn't even try that. Um, he just, he really wanted us to be elegant and, um, and, and careful. And he, but he was strict. You know, he was really strict. And he was, of course, always worried about the, the end, which could be happening any second. <laughs> Who knows? But he was constantly worried about the end, the, you know, the, devolving of society as we know it and, you know, full exclusion of anybody who doesn't um, seem to be n normal. Um, so, of course, our childhood was, it was like, don't do that because, you know, don't, one, he always had these certain things, like, it is the, the worst thing to hit one car with the other. <laughs> So if you're backing in, you know, if you hit the other car with the, with the one car, and just all of these d dangerous things. Oh, when I was traveling in my car all the time through upstate New York, when I got a, you know a job after college, he wanted he actually wanted me to uh, have that that blow up man sit in my. I said I don't think anybody's tricked by that, Dad. And then he was even more concerned about you than you knew. That was always surprising. He was much more concerned about you than you had a clue about. But generally speaking, we were super, we, we all acknowledged that we were really lucky. I mean, my, my father and my, both my parents, my father, if, you know, for this presentation, he, he was interested in so many different things. I mean, at one point I had, um, I had a car accident, so I was recuperating with them, and so I couldn't sleep at night. So he gave me a load of work <laughs> to go track down this certain um, suite of tarot cards because there was an image of somebody who was devalued in the tarot cards. And then he said in the morning, I you know gave it to him, and he said, I have been asking for 15 years. <laughs> so he liked what technology could do for you, but he was... Um, so I'm sorry, I veered off on that one. But the point of his point was to keep me busy, so I wasn't thinking about um, what I had to deal with at the time. And so he was much more concerned about you than you thought. But yeah, strict, and you know. But boy, we are we are competent people. <laughs> <laughs> we can say that. Thank you. Oh, Frank Melnicino. Oh my, uh, yes, I was oh. talking about this all day. Um, the Melnicinos were wild. I was just saying, they, they had a lot of children and they had children at very, every single age, I think every single grade in, uh, in our school. And, uh, they were wild. I think there were six or seven of them and they ran all over the place and they, the, they were always getting, the boys were always getting in trouble and, um, but my father and, and Dr. Melnicina were, were constantly screaming at each other and arguing and then one would yell at the other and they would run across the gully and have some kind of, you know, big, big fight of some sort. You know, of course we're children and we don't really understand what's going on. We, but they come away laughing. My father was very humorous, very, very humorous. And so it was Frank Melnicino and, um, that whole family was actually very humorous and very, um, 
they just they did a lot of things. You know, they always had something going on. You know, they were they were allowed to play with you know the, the toys that could burn you. <laughs> We love that. <laughs> My father would have been like, no, no. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was really the most fascinating childhood, I have to say. And being here in Omaha during those formative years was just, it was just magic. And, you know, my parents, so when my dad was really building his career. And uh, so was, was Frank Malmacino. And, and they just, they would have joint parties together and, um, the truly the academic, you know, kind of um, wine and dine, on a, and we always had people in from overseas in all of our houses. And uh, depending on what age we were at the time was how we we treated that whole situation. For example, in high school, we wouldn't take our clothes out the night before and then burst in in the morning, say, "Oops, I forgot to take my clothes for school," because we <laughs> get tired of that. So it was magical. It was great. Both of our parents were very interesting, and um, and uh, my father was just out there uh, in terms of intellect, and of course what he was doing, which you just saw. And um, but he was fun. He was very fun. I have a question. Um, this sort of goes back to the whole thing of what Wolf worked on. Um, how how does what you guys do and you teach and you advocate? I mean, where did like mainstreaming? Because I have a sister that's uh, mentally has Down syndrome, and she was you know that's when mainstreaming started. You know, so how how did that ever fit into any of that? <laughs> so obviously we all have something to say about it. Um, so as you heard uh, Dr. Bergman say, um, one of Wolf's things over and over was every good idea has within it the core of, uh, you know, the possibility of its own or the seed of its own perversion. And so he was very precise, you know, what he meant by things. And so um, he would talk about the importance of valued social integration um, not just people being present, but their presence being valued and actually participating, not just sitting there, so to speak, you know. And so he would look at some of the other ideas that had some connection to that or had something similar, but what would always say, well, you know, is it, is it, uh, accurate? Is it, um, it, does it have the seed of its own perversion in it, you know, or is it going that way? And so all sorts of ideas about mainstreaming and so on. Um, he would say, well, here's what's good about it, but also here's what's problematic about it. You know, he was very analytic. Um, uh, yeah. um, what do you, having uh, worked with Dr. Wolfensberger, um, what do you ha what are you your reaction to the film and what do you think he would think of the film? It's a good film. It's um it's wonderful to see so many old friends all in one place, you know, it looked kind of is like attending a reunion to some degree. But um, I think it's also a very instructive film. And when I show it to groups who know nothing about SRV or normalization, frankly, when I show it in agencies and there's a lot of young service workers, I'm quite surprised, or I was, I'm not anymore because I'm used to it now, but I was quite surprised by the initial reaction. People would be overcome. And they would be overcome, like emotionally overcome, um, at the notion of the conditions of the institutions. And we grew up with that. But the new service worker of today, that's, that's way back, you know. And I don't think that everybody believed it, that it was as bad as it was. And the film makes you stare that in the face. So it's very instructive in that, in that regard. And then what's to be done about that? 
in terms of people having value roles, in terms of normalizing life for people as best as we can. So it's instructive in that way. Um, so I, I think it also is pretty honest in tracing. He had a big uh, period of notoriety, and then he had a period where he was even despised by some. And I think the film is honest about that. And I think it's honest about why. The one thing I will say, though, is um, in telling that part of the story, um, I think it gives a little bit of a misconception that Wolfensberger was not a grumpy um, uh, man with no uh, joy or hope. Wolfensberger was um, a very, very hopeful person. He had a lot of belief in human capacity for good. And although he could also see very clearly the downside, um, he, he, he was never discouraging. I would say he was encouraging in the sense of appealing to the very best part of who we are, knowing we can do better. And I think the film may sell that a little short, at least that's my impression, you know. Um, I think I'll... I, I would just add that I can imagine that Dr. Welfensberger would feel that... <clears throat> how can I say this? He would not be thinking this in a... or saying this in a self-aggrandizing way, but he was always very particular about anything presented being very complete. And so workshops, some of the workshops that are offered now and were offered then would be seven full days from the first thing in the morning till very late at night or uh, six days or eight days or whatever it was. And so he was so thorough about things. And I know that it was very difficult for Jerry Smith, who put this together, to cull this down to the, the one hour that it is. And I think that Dr. Wolfensberger would have found it painful to have so many things that couldn't be addressed or couldn't be explored more in more detail in the film. So that would be my guess. Susan? Well, um, so I worked with and for Dr. Wolfensberger for 38 years, so I very much have the same kinds of styles that... <laughs> about certain things. So I have four points <laughs> in response. <laughs> so one is, um, you know, as Jane said, um, what Jerry had to do. Think of anybody you know. Um, how do you boil down a life? He was 77 years old when he died to one hour and just one aspect of it, you know. Um, uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> It's hopeless, you know? um, but he, he did a really good job, I think, of focusing on those uh, things, and I think uh, Wolf would recognize that. Um, I also uh, want to underline what Joe said, my second point, about, you know, people say, well, you wouldn't find a lot of hope there, and he was pessimistic. He was not. He was realistic, but people heard that as pessimism, because if you're not over the moon, everything's going to be great, we're going to fix it tomorrow, then you're pessimistic, you know. Um, and he had great hope um, in that realism. And thirdly, I think one of the things that he would like about the film was that he himself was an historian. That was one of his interests. He loved history, and he studied it. What can history teach us. And, you know, history is one of those things, it's one of the best instructors, but it's also one of those things that nobody pays attention to. <laughs> um, and we have sayings about that, you know. Um, the thing we learn from history is that nobody ever learns anything from history. And uh, the historian Gilson, Etienne Gilson, says that history is the only laboratory in which you can see the test of big ideas, big ideas, right? You have to see time, how they work out, you know? Um, and so I think the, the film captured that because it showed that, wow, everybody thought at the beginning, normalization is the answer. We just have to get those people out of the institution and everything is going to be, well, it didn't take 
too long to show that that really wasn't the case, you know. And, um, and people are often so hard. That's another thing that you learn about history. People are so hard on those who came before. Those dumb people, what was the matter with them? Couldn't they see, you know, what the, we would never do anything like that. Ha ha ha. You know, just wait 20 years or 50 years and they look back at us and they say, what was the matter with them? Couldn't they see it? You know, um, and Wolf had great sympathy. He had learned that lesson and he had great sympathy for people today and behind and in the future and ever because, um, as John Armstrong said, he had a lot of insight into human nature and he'd learned from history. So those are my thoughts about the film. You talked about um, teaching uh, people like out in the community, service providers and things like that. And I don't think the panel can, well, the, the question is twofold. Do any of you on the panel, do you ever come do any presentations in Nebraska besides this to our Department of Health and Human Services? And then my second question would maybe be to the library folks, uh, will this documentary, since we are a teaching institution here, will it be shown to the people that we are preparing as doctors? Because as a parent, the first person you're going to talk to is a doctor. And what they tell you makes all the difference in the world. Because if, you're, if the doctor tells you that your child needs to go to an institution or if the doctor tells you that your child has potential. So I guess a twofold question, one for the panel, do you ever come here to Nebraska and do anything? And I guess two to the, the library personnel here, how is this DVD, this documentary going to be shared here at UNMC? So for the first part, there are some of us who are teachers, and we teach different kinds of workshops. Some are social role valorization workshops. The reason I got Cameron's first question is because um, I work with medical vulnerability, right? So we, we, we teach in different aspects. But um, we generally go, those of us who teach, and there's all speaking for the three of us at least, um, we go where we're invited to go. So that's the short answer. From the library's perspective, I would say that we would absolutely want to share the DVD and work with um, faculty across the institution. Um, it, it's definitely something that we would be interested in doing. I think one of the questions or one of the comments that Cameron is addressing and in, in working with the collection is trying to get the word out on Dr. Wolfensberger's work to the next group of um, practitioners and, and to keep that spirit going. And so that's one reason why we're so privileged to have this collection and, and why Cameron is working with it, um, because we want to get that word out. Um, and so part of that is definitely showing the DVD and trying to see how we can integrate different things in the curriculum. May that, is a, that is a wonderful question. Um, and to echo what Emily said, we, the, the main uphill battle is we just need to raise awareness and keep doing events like this and eventually it'll catch on because um, the ideas are, they're so broad to address every devalued person and in the hospital setting it's ex extremely sensitive and I think it would help our doctors come out of here being much better people, people. <laughs> so, and to not address them as, oh, that's the Alzheimer's patient, they actually see that person, um, I think that'd be really powerful to include. May I just add one more point and say that in the, at least in the East Coast, we do um, pretty regularly a Grand Rounds presentation on social role valorization in the hospital. And then the follow-up is parents talking to doctors because that link has to be made, as you point out. So there's many, many possibilities. How much influence do you think the programs and policies of Nazi Germany had on his ideas and beliefs? Well, he was a child during the war. Um, he was only um, 11 years old when the war ended. 
he, like the children of really all the European nations, um, whether you were an Axis or ally country, if you were a child in the European nations, you often were sent to the countryside for protection away from the cities. And so and that happened to him and uh, affected him deeply. Um, he remembered, uh, as you would, you know, a child, you remember very much the things that happened to you and and things that affected him deeply. And um, And then he studied it. You know, he studied it. Um, You heard Margaret uh, speak about how he he looked. um, He was never afraid to look anything hard in the face. And he looked back and he said, "You know, they could have seen it coming." It was. He's not the only one who said that. You know, historians and all say they could have seen it coming, and and uh, people could have done things differently. And so, what can you learn from this again? You know, not just what happened, but what can you learn from this? And one of the things that he learned was one of the things that made him so unpopular when he became unpopular, which was to say some of the same things that happened then. We see parallels. He saw parallels here, and nobody wanted to hear that. Nobody wanted to hear that. You know. But as you heard in the film, his daughter Margaret said he took, if pride is the right word, he he was going to tell the truth, come what may. So in that sense, it really did affect him and continued to affect him through his whole life. Just just briefly, I I, I did, you know, my father was very charming and, and fun, but he was extremely serious as well. If You can obviously figure that out, but um, I think Cameron and I were talking about that this today that the war itself as an experience I mean we always knew about the war we were very aware of the war we had uh, family members you know taken away we had we have a whole bunch of drama around the war and our family and what happened because we were um, on my we are partly Jewish and so um I think that as I get older, I notice more and more that that experience impacted his work even further. Um, you just live it, you know. You're you're you know you're you're like okay, war is part of our family, and this is part of his work. But I really feel it now more than ever. One of the things we're doing here in Omaha, other than this evening, is uh, benefiting from the wonderful archives and um, Cameron's help, of course, as well. And so I've been looking through some of the biographical material and some letters and correspondence, and there's an immense amount of that. And one of the little snippets I came across today speaks to this question you ask. And um, he is corresponding with someone and pointing out that his observation was that the killing of handicapped people, um, which preceded the killing of Jews in Nazi Germany, that that killing of handicapped people paved the way, in a sense, for the later extermination of Jews. And so that, that was an insight that many people didn't have and perhaps still don't have today. Okay. We have about seven. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, quickly to piggyback on the uh, the idea of having doctors uh, see this, I would also say special education, social work students. Uh, let's really get that word out. That is a good thing. And, and kind of on that. Um, the, the film talked about those who, who kind of took the seed that was planted uh, by, Dr., by Dr. Wolfensberger. Who are you seeing now out there? What, what, what are the categories of people? Um, I, I work for the ARC of Nebraska, and parents are tired, and they don't have a lot of time and energy outside of caring for their children or adult children. So, so who, who's taking up the next big round of advocacy and and uh, getting out there and, and working on these things. Uh, who who do we need to target to to help fight the fight? Uh, 
Most of my work is with um, people who are involved in human service in some way. So either residential providers or um, I work a lot with uh, clinicians. Um, and you're right about the parents. They are exhausted and they need a partnership. And the partnership they're looking for is with, um, is with service workers. And so what does that mean for the service worker then? It means that they better be right-headed about things. And so social role valorization and other of Wolfensberger's work helps that right-headedness to be created. And you don't hear much from other, I don't hear much from other human service sectors about why family is important and why in particular families are important for people with impairments, excuse me. And that was Wolf's clear message. He was an ally for families. And so what we're trying to do in, in appealing to the service workers is getting that point across so the partnership can be formed. So, um, again, a few points. So, in the video, you heard uh, one of the commentators, Chris Liuzzo, talk about the intensity of the workshop and it started at 8, and he said, you know, you'd go till 2 in the morning, and then the next day you'd pick up and you'd do it again and again and again. And it wasn't just workshops. I wasn't uh, here. I didn't start working for Dr. Wolfensberger until uh, he came to Syracuse Uni uh, University. But I understand that in the time in Nebraska when Joan was a child here, that that's what they all did. He was working with parents and, and, and they all, they would, you know, here were parents, they had jobs, you know, and they'd work all day and then they'd go to committee meetings all night and they had to prepare and then they'd drive across the state to Lincoln to meet with the legislators and, and, and it was just, you know, but th that's what they had to do and they did it, you know, and nobody ever thought it was going to ever be anything but hard. But we're in a different cultural context now. And that's another of the things that made him very unpopular, was to talk about the change in the cultural context. And the expectation that this might be what you might have to do for, you didn't know when it was going to end and to, to accomplish something. And then you couldn't stop there either, because what you did accomplish, now you had to protect <laughs> and you had to safeguard it, right? Um, and, and so one of the things that's happened, and by the way, John Murphy and uh, disability rights advocacy, uh, disability, sorry, John, you always change your name. What's it called now? Disability Rights Nebraska, <laughs> sorry. Um, in Lincoln, they can talk about that because advocacy is what they're about, you know, and they foster many different kinds of it through the law and through recruiting. That was another Dr. Wolfensberger's inventions while he was here was a recruiting individual citizens to voluntarily take up the the cause and alliance and relationship with an individual person and John and his uh, is still trying to do that throughout the state. Um, but, but one of the things that's happened with the cultural context is a kind of putting it on the very people themselves to carry it. So we get this quote self advocacy as if that could do the whole thing. And then everybody else just sits back and lets, you know, and so it's not a really promising picture. <laughs> I'm a member of a, uh, an organization in, in a small town near me that's a, a, a local, a city organization, and we struggle a lot with the, well, at times it's been a schism. We're working really hard. So the old parents, as they're called, and so those are the, the parents who have been at it since their children were very young and their sons and daughters now are in their 60s and 70s, and the parents, as you say, they're exhausted. Um, and they sometimes find it hard to relate to newer family members because they're, they don't always feel that their fight has been appreciated. So new parents come along and their children automatically go to a regular school. And there are a number of other things that those old parents had to fight so hard for. And the struggle, in a sense, is to help the, again, for lack of a better word, the younger parents appreciate that things are not fine now. And that there are, it's true, there have been some advances and improvements, but, but there are some perversions and some very clear dangers. And so it, the struggle is to 
um, have the, the more seasoned parents be able to convey what they need to to younger parents and inspire them to have that sense of fight that that parents have had historically. All right. Oh, go ahead. All of this sounds really good, and we can have the schools and all the services there, but if we don't have the business owners that will employ our young people, it's all for naught. And so the government doesn't help with, an, with employment. My son has a part-time job at a restaurant. The owner has to fill out two hours worth of paperwork to be twice a year to be able to employ him. At first I said, let him work for free, and he said, well, that would be a $25,000 fine. So a lot of this is great, but then the business community has to step up. And that's what a lot of the parents are finding is that, yeah, our kids are educated. Yes, they can do these things. And then they get employed three hours a day. Mm -hmm. That's true. One of the beauties, if you will, of social role valorization is it's not directed just toward families or just toward service workers or just toward um, board members. And when we teach it, oftentimes there's average citizens and, you know, I can't say we have a lot of business owners, but it's not unheard of. And um, so it has this, it deals with universals, as he says. So it has this, um, it teaches the capacity in a broad way for what we need, right? So I certainly agree, and that's the whole idea behind citizen advocacy is that the typical shop owner or restaurateur might um, see it in his heart and see it in his business model to improve things for people. And again, there's... Yes, yes. Well, we would, you know, just keep in mind what Susan said originally, too, is this is not a big popular movement, but it's a steady movement. And um, now I would say as well that it, it used to be pretty contained in services for people with intellectual impairments. And now I would say it's broadened, it's broadened much, much more so. So still a drop in the bucket, but... One little thing about an initiative uh, near where I am is a project that came about through the Rotary Movement. You have Rotarians, right? And um, they have mounted a project um, about employment. And um, Rotarians come from all walks of life, as you know. And so they've had some success in small areas in terms of engaging ordinary business people in, um, in it's sort of inspiring them to involve people with, with disabilities. It's just one little thing. Cam? Yes. Are you wrap, are you a, we wanted to remind people to fill out the evaluation yep. that's inside. But also, I would like to thank, I would like us to you know, give a round of applause to Cam, because he was the instigator for all of this and getting this or, you know, initially organized. <laughs> and it does appear we are out of time, but I would just like to say in closing that small changes make a very big difference. And if you like this, request it from us more. Spread the word yourselves. The library will be there to support this and the spread of information. Um, and contact um, any of us at the library for more information. You can contact me. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, and thank you for coming. <laughs>